Okay, good morning. Um, thank you very much, Mohammed. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate uh, being here. Um, I'm a postdoctoral biophotician with Mark Blackster, um, and I don't really work on recombination. Um, I'm hoping to work on recombination in the years to come, and that's why I'm here, because I'm uh, really excited to, to meet many of you. But um, what I'm going to talk about today is genome scaffolding. So if you have email to catch up on, then feel free. I won't be offended. Um, but I hope that I can sort of uh, make this interesting to you, because um, as we've seen in many of the talks, um, most people here are working on model organisms, and there's a good reason for that, which is that to work on recombination rate, you really need to know what your genome is first. But we've also seen um, in Brett's talk this morning, for example, that it can really help to have multiple species available um, if we want to study recombination rate over the span of evolution. So um, I think this is the, the kind of thing that a lot of people are going to want to do um, as we go forward to try and make sense of a lot of the non-model organisms that we would like to work with if we had decent genome sequences for them. So I'm going to talk about um, my very small part in the Heliconius genome paper which came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, here is the uh, Heliconius Genome Consortium. Here are the Europeans up at the top, North Americans here, South Americans here. Um, and this has been a genome done on a, on a shoestring um, that uh, each lab put in uh, sort of ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 and pooled our resources. Um, it hasn't been grant funded or anything, we've just done it sort of on, on the side um, and, and put together a genome in the process. So I'm going to sort of talk about how we've gone about that. Um, but first I'm just going to say a little bit about why we work on Heliconius, why we're interested in it um, and why it might make a good model for, for recombination studies. Um, so here is a distribution of Heliconius errato all across South America and as you can see there are a huge range of different wing patterns in different locations uh, across the continent. Um, but why people study Heliconius is that there are related species which have exactly the same wing patterns and yet these are very different species. They're perhaps 10 million years diverged um, and there's a whole different range of, of divergent times in different species but with these very very accurate mimicked patterns all the way across the continent. And so there are these mimicry rings that build up and the same mimicry is found again and again and again in all these different uh, locations. And so um, we are treating this as a, as a sort of um, laboratory for speciation. Um, it means we can look at lots of different pairs of these butterflies and there are about 40 different species, these are just two, and each of those species has sub uh, species and races like this. Um, so we can start to think about uh, looking at very closely related species, uh, species with hybrid zones uh, between different sub uh, subspecies and so on, to species that are very far diverged from each other and really start to think about um, what the impact of those different uh, divergence rates is and start to think about how these phenotypes are being uh, spread around like this. And there's a lot of cool biology which I'm not going to talk about in the, in the genome paper about how this happens. Please go and look that up because it's really great. Um, but this is why we, we wanted to start out by building a genome sequence for um, Heliconius melpomene melpomene. So that's this race down here, um, which is a, a frequently uh, studied butterfly and is mimicked by Hydara up here. Um, and so we built uh, a basic genome scaffold, which would be a, a publishable genome. Many other uh, first draft genomes come out um, in this kind of state, which had about 4,000 genome scaffolds, um, was 269 megabases long. We think the actual genome is about 290 megabases based on earlier flow cytometry estimates, so we probably collapsed a bit of repeat in there. Um, and we've got an N50 of about 212 KB. If you know what that means, that's great. If you don't know what that means, don't worry. I can explain it later if you're interested. Um, uh, it, it, it basically just means that the, the uh, genome scaffolds are of a reasonable size. Um, and this just gives you a, a pictorial uh, example of that. So here are the 4,000 genome scaffolds ranked by size, so largest first, smallest last. Um, and this is the cumulative uh, proportion of bases covered in the genome. Uh, so this will be up to 269 megabases. So what this is showing is that about 90% of our genome is in just under 2,000 scaffolds, about 50% in under 500 scaffolds. So it's a reasonably well assembled genome, um, but it's still in thousands of bits, and this is actually a very common situation for uh, genome assemblies, which makes it extremely difficult to think about um, looking at things on chromosomes. We don't have these scaffolds on chromosomes. It's very difficult to think about how things are changing over the span of the genome. So what we wanted to do was come up with some easy way of putting these scaffolds onto chromosomes. And so what we ended up doing is basically making a linkage map 
um, just using a standard linkage mapping cross, um, but then sequencing the individuals in that linkage map, um, calling SNPs from these sequences, um, and using the uh, linkage map markers to place the scaffold onto uh, this linkage map. Um, and so I'm going to talk about how we've gone about doing this. Um, Luana Moroja here um, constructed a, a cross between a Heliconus melpomene malpomene father, so this is the genome strain, and a Heliconus melpomene rosina mother. So rosina is up here. Um, there's a little hybrid zone between rosina and melpomene. They're known to hybridize in the wild and you can hybridize them uh, in the insectary as well. Um, so we took these two strains to ensure that we have plenty of SNPs. Um, created a, a two F1 parents and then 109 F2 progeny. Now, because we're working on a shoestring, this is kind of a pilot project that I'm reporting on, and we're going to do this properly uh, as we go forward. Um, but we actually only sequenced 43 individuals um, in this uh, cross. Um, so that means we're actually quite limited here in terms of centimorgan resolution. We would obviously like to do a lot better than this. Um, but we basically got a recombination something like every 360 uh, kilobases. So what that means is that many of these scaffolds, because they're actually a lot shorter than 360 kilobases, we're not going to be able to order perfectly, but we hope that we are going to be able to put them on the chromosomes in the first place. So that's what I'm going to go on to show you now. So we've done this sequencing with a method called RAD sequencing or restriction site associated DNA sequencing because we couldn't afford whole genome sequencing of even 43 uh, butterflies, um, certainly not 109, although again, that's what we're going to do this year. Um, so we're using this method, RAD sequencing, which is just a reduced representation method. Um, you basically end up with SNPs, like whole genome SNPs, uh, when, when, you're, when you're done. Um, but what we're doing is we're cutting up a genome at restriction sites, very similar to the method that Nadia talked about yesterday. Um, so here's a zoom in on one particular restriction site in the, the genome. And then the end result of the process that we use is to end up with Illumina-based reads downstream and upstream of every restriction site in the genome. Now this is what we'd have if we did single end sequencing, but if we do paired end sequencing, one aspect of the RAD prep involves shearing uh, your fragments down to a sort of uh, random size up to Illumina fragment length of about 700, 800 bases. So um, we actually get uh, a fragment for more or less every single base along this region, and so we can cover um, a paired end region downstream of every site of about two to 500 bases. And this means that we've actually got a span of about a kilobase around every restriction site that, that we can cover and score SNPs in that region. This is what a pileup of that data looks like. So here's the restriction site right in the middle. Here are the single end reads sort of stacked up here and you can see, well maybe you can't see, but all of these sort of point in uh, away from the, the restriction site. And then here are the heaps of paired end reads, um, all at slightly different lengths, which all point in the other direction into the restriction site. Um, but we can effectively just treat these as whole genome sequencing reads. Um, we align them with uh, Stampy, and then we call with the genome uh, uh, analysis toolkit unified genotyper, um, and we can just use them uh, in a VCF file like any other uh, set of next generation SNPs. And so that's what we've gone on to do. Okay, so this is the cross that we had. We've sequenced 43 of these um, individuals. We cut up the genome with PST1, which is a six base cutter, um, which should give us 27,000 sites, or at least we, we can count 27,000 PST1 sites in our draft genome scaffolds. So if they're evenly distributed, we expect to have about one site every 10 kilobases. Uh, that's uh, given the GC content of the, the genome that we have, and that's just a very crude calculation, but just to give us an order of magnitude here. So if we've got a recombination every 360 kilobases, we should be able to score every one of those recombinations fairly reliably with markers every 10 kb. And we were able to sequence these individuals in just one high seq lane. So we've got 106 million reads, and we've managed to do genome-wide sequencing of 43 individuals. So the other thing that I forgot to say about the RAD method is that you can barcode your individuals so we can pool all of our individuals together into one lane. We don't have to use separate lanes or anything like that. Again, very similar to what Nadia was talking about yesterday. What we end up with when we align these reads is 11.2 million bases that are covered uh, by at least one individual. 
and that means we have uh, bases covered in 2,700 of our scaffolds. Remember, we had 4,000 scaffolds. Um, but remember also that most of those scaffolds, or many of those scaffolds, were very, very small. And indeed, it's the small ones that we're missing. So we actually managed to span, if we could scaffold all of these scaffolds onto chromosomes, we would get 99% of our genome uh, onto chromosomes. However, we wanted to be very conservative about this um, because we weren't convinced that this rad method was going to work. Um, and we, we wanted to make sure that the markers were as accurate as possible before we made any decisions about our genome scaffolds. So we restricted ourselves firstly to only bases that were called in every single individual. We're not letting any missing individuals in just yet. Um, and that drops us right down to 187,000 bases covered. Um, and then we, again, selected only high-quality SNPs, so we're using genotype quality of 30 and, and uh, various different mapping qualities, um, depending on the region. And so we end up with 30,000 SNPs, but this is from nothing, okay? So we had nothing initially, and we've ended up with 30,000 SNPs across the genome. And although that drops us down to about 1,700 scaffolds, well, 1,800 scaffolds, we're still able to uh, potentially map about 91% of the genome if we can convert those SNPs into markers. So that's what we did, we just convert it into join map format and then Simon Baxter used join map to construct this linkage map which is 21 chromosomes, 20 autosomes and the, the, the Z chromosome. Um, we don't have the W chromosome yet, the female chromosome, because the genome was sequenced from a male. Uh, from a, uh, uh, yes, from a male. <laughs> um, so we have 21 chromosomes, we ended up with 27,000 of those 30,000 SNPs after we did some filtering for segregation, distortion, and things like that. Um, so that's 27,000 individual markers, but because we're actually limited by recombination, we've only got 508 unique loci, and different loci that we've actually got placed on this map. If we sequence the other 66 individuals, we would do a lot better there with the same uh, markers. But we end up with a map that's uh, just under 1,500 centimorgans long, and we can we, we have SNPs on 1,649 scaffolds, which means that we can place 231 megabases of our 267 megabase genome um, onto chromosomes using these SNPs. And so I'm just going to show you how that actually works. This is a zoom in of chromosome 18. Um, I'm zooming in on chromosome 18 because that includes um, the uh, scaffold that controls uh, the red bands on the wing pattern. And this is the chromosomal scaffold that we've been able to put together. So the black lines are scaffold separators, so each one of these purple blocks is one scaffold. Um, and this red block up here is the, the um, red band gene region. Um, and so what you can see is we've been able to order uh, quite a number of scaffolds onto this chromosome. And this is how the physical map relates to the genetic map. So each of these vertical lines here is a SNP. And so these lines just show how many SNPs we have per uh, marker on the uh, genetic map. And so we're able to, and, and remember that these SNPs have all come from aligning reads to these scaffolds. So we can uh, say that this scaffold here is oriented along the map in this direction and is placed here on the genetic map because we have three markers um, all aligned to this particular scaffold. Now this is slightly misleading, this particular plot, because remember we don't have recombinations sufficient to resolve all of our uh, scaffolds. So for example, if we were to just go purely by the genetic map, we wouldn't be able to order or orient these scaffolds here, right? because we only have one uh, genetic marker with the number of individuals that we have. However, we still feel that this is quite an advance to be able to say, well, we know that this bunch of scaffolds is on this chromosome, and it's roughly in this position on, on this chromosome. And we've also been able to use um, Bombix information. So Bombix mori, the silkworm, is uh, uh, the, the first sequenced lepidopteran genome. So we've been able to do quite a bit of synteny work. These are all individual genes um, to actually order these um, scaffolds beyond that. But this is not ideal. You can see we still have a lot of um, suspect regions here. There's a lot of very imperfect uh, mapping of genes to location. We're not sure how much of that is our genome being wrong, how much of that is the Bombix genome being wrong, and how much of it is actual genuine biology. Um, this is the, the best we can do at the moment with the data that we have. But what it does allow us to do, even though we, we can't quite be sure about the small scale uh, ordering, is to do the large scale ordering of chromosomes and look at synteny 
um, across these genomes. So this is a, a plot that Annabelle Wibley put together, which shows the Heliconis genomes, uh, Heliconis chromosome in colour, and the Bombyx genomes in, in grey here. And so we can see every major uh, fusion or, or splitting event uh, across these genomes. And we can also do the same for Plutella xylostella, the diamondback moth, because we have a rad map for that. Um, and we can do that with any other um, Lepidopteran genome that we can fit in. So it, it allows us, uh, with just one lane of sequencing, to actually do some quite substantial uh, whole genome structural investigations. Okay. So what can we do if we have uh, a fairly drafty genome, first pass genome, and we want to put that genome onto, scaffold, uh, onto chromosomes? Well, we can take uh, a basic linkage map, sequence the individuals in that map, which is one lane of sequencing, um, using this reduced representation method, it's rad sequencing, and we end up with a plot like this. Um, so we believe this will be a useful method for people who uh, want to do other non model organisms, and um, we're sort of working with a, a few other groups to do this in, in other species. But obviously the, what we'd really like to do is whole genome sequencing here, and this is what we're going to go on to do, is do whole genome sequencing of these 109 individuals and see if we can really get all those rest, the rest of those scaffolds onto the map. Um, we don't know how long a method like this is going to be useful because, of course, we all hope that Oxford Net 4 is going to come online and, and you know, corrected PAP bio reads are going to be wonderfully productive and um, we can actually fix a lot of the problems um, with, with this kind of genome scaffolding with long reads. But we will see. This is something that we can do today and it may be that this is something that is, is a useful thing to do for several years to come. But what we're really excited about with this is that it gives us uh, a way to look at more structural stuff like recombination rate. So what we would really like to do is to be doing this in lots of different crosses, uh, to do it in Heliconius sydno, to do it in various other different species, and to really start to look at recombination rate across the genome. Um, and we haven't done that in any detail with this particular cross because it's just not dense enough, and there are really irritating sort of tentative signals like this is the most highly dense recombinant region just over the red band uh, genes here, but we can't make anything of that yet because we need high resolution data, we need the whole genome data, we need to uh, up the number of individuals. So um, what we're heading towards and what we'd really like to do, and I'm sure what many people in this room would like to do, is to get to sperm sequencing. Um, because doing crosses like this is very boring and w we actually in the butterflies can only get up to about 100 uh, offspring particularly if we're doing cross-species crosses, which is where a lot of the really interesting stuff will come in. Um, so if there's anybody in here who is, is doing uh, single sperm seeks, I know there are a couple, or, or wants to do it, then I'd be really interested to talk to you about that, uh, about what you're thinking about and, and how we might go about making that happen. Because it seems to, to, to us, if, if we can get this working, then it's going to be useful for any species, regardless of whether you can do a cross or not. Um, and so it really feels like an important thing to get, get sorted in the next few years. Um, okay, so that's all I'm going to say for now. Um, I do recommend that you, you have a look at the, the Heliconis paper because there's some lovely stuff about chromosomal inversions and recombination deserts and things like that that I just haven't got time to talk about. Um, but I'd just like to finish by thanking um, Simon Baxter who uh, made the linkage map and has been involved in this work from the start, Luana Moroja who did the um, uh, uh, cross, uh, Dural Kapan and Chris Jiggins who's, who's funded quite a bit of this work and, and sort of co-led the consortium. I'd also like to thank the gene pool in Edinburgh and my boss Mark Blackster who have done all the sequencing for this project, this particular bit of it, the genome sequencing is all over the place but the rad sequencing has been done in Edinburgh. Um, if you want more information about rad sequencing we have a wiki at radseq.info um, and I'd just like to thank the Natural Environment Research Council and the BBSRC in the UK for funding. Thank you very much for your attention.